Tonight we're going to continue our study of subjective versus objective thinking. And since we finished the introduction, we're going to come at this briefly from the standpoint of Israel's history, and then we're going to move on into the life of David and eventually have a clear delineation between the life of David and his objective thinking and the life of Saul and his subjective thinking, but we won't get that far today. So in order for us as believers, priests, to have the opportunity to be in fellowship, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a royal priest the opportunity to represent yourself before God and name your sins in order that God the Holy Spirit might empower you to understand and utilize the things that we're about to note. With that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to feed on your word this evening. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might understand and be able to utilize these spiritual skills in our life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. History repeats itself. That's what my 10th grade history, one of the best ones I had, liked to quote. He was good at analyzing history. And he always liked to cite that quote. And this is a correct thought, for history does repeat itself. This nation has been going through a historical downtrend for at least 50 years, depending on how you measure the historical downtrends. We're not close to being the same people we were just 50 years ago. As far as our nation's spiritual status goes, we have stumbled into an era of extraordinary apostasy and rampant subjective thinking. We actually have sects of so-called Christianity today that believe that God the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, as they call it, can give them the gift of holy laughter. I've seen this on television, people lathering themselves up emotionally, and they just laugh hysterically. God did not design his royal family to act like psychos, weirdos, or nitwits. No wonder evangelism is having such a hard time in this country. The unbeliever will look at this and say, look, it's one of those Christians who does nothing but laugh for no reason at all. I don't know how accurate this is, but I heard that at least 90% of the ministers up north do not believe that the scriptures are God-breathed. They believe that the Bible is actually not the authority when it comes to spiritual matters. These ministers have tried to humanize God. They've turned God into nothing more than an employee at a drive through window. <coughs> May I take your order? Yes. I would like to win the lottery and have a beautiful wife. Okay, that'll be seven Sundays of church. Drive around. This is the way Christianity is gone today, and this is, of course, not the Christian way of life. Yet so many believers in this country view God as their little genie in the sky. We need a serious turnaround in this country. It's not that we have too few believers. It's that we have too many believers who are completely and totally ignorant of the Word of God. Every day we live in this country, we're under danger of the fifth cycle of discipline. If just three terrorists get their hands on a dirty bomb and they place them in New York, L.A., or Chicago, that's the end of prosperity in this country. That's all it takes. Just look what a few planes did. If God decides to punish his children collectively, and most of God's children today live in the United States, we could very well see the end of the United States of America. But God has graced us out so far, and he's doing this because of a few Pleroma believers, a few people living the unique spiritual life. God has honored those people. And for that reason alone, the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of discipline have been held off. 9-11 was a wake-up call for America, not just for unbelievers, but for believers who have failed to live the unique spiritual life of all human history. After 9-11, 
Did Bible doctrine take number one place in your life? This is something to ask yourself. For God is giving this nation a chance, maybe one last chance, to wake up to the fact that the most important thing in life is Bible doctrine, the Word of God. The most important thing is not your favorite television show, your favorite game, or your favorite hobby. The most important thing in life is and should always be Bible doctrine. And God has made this available to you for you to take in free of charge in a free country. So what's wrong? Subjective thinking, arrogance, preoccupation with self. It's time to wake up. For if any of us make it to Pleroma Tutheu, then the influence on this country and those around us will be immeasurable. We need now more than ever in this country that immeasurable influence. For if people do not start maturing and replacing those spiritual mature belie- Americans who have gone on to be with the Lord, our nation will be doomed. For this reason, we're going to take a look at the nation of Israel before David's reign as king, even before Saul or Samuel. We're going to see a nation that is in the quite the same position as ours is now. And we're going to see how God delivered that rebellious nation time after time. But we will also see how the nation of Israel was punished severely. First, we'll take a look at how degenerate the nation of Israel became and how it got so degenerate that the people became shocked, just as many Christians are shocked today at immoral immoral degeneracy. We will see how the legalist became shocked and we will see how this shock accomplished nothing because it was not followed up with number one Bible doctrine. After the Exodus generation, that's the one that left Egypt, of course, came the generation of Joshua. That generation had a large pivot of mature believers in the land and Israel was victorious time and time again against her enemies and Israel prospered during the days of Joshua when he was leader. Joshua died at the age of 110. The generation of Joshua and the generation of Joshua's children maintained a sizable pivot of mature believers. But when the last Jeshurun believers, that's the play Roma equivalent for Old Testament saints, after they died off, Israel went into a rapid downtrend historically. The grandchildren of Joshua's generation turned from Bible doctrine. And while many were believers, they rejected the word of God and began to worship idols. So what's the comparison to the United States? We don't worship idols, do we? We do. In fact, believers in this country worship more idols than the people of Israel could even comprehend. Do you know what your idol is? Your idol is whatever you place above the Word of God. What takes precedence in your life over the Word of God? Is it television? Then television is your idol. Is it a hobby? Golf? Then golf is your idol. Anything you place in priority over the Word of God is your idol. And most believers in this country are idolatrous. They are either involved in self-worship that is the legalism of the day. Or they are antinomianism and go the way of lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, turning their every pleasure into their own little precious idol. Turn in your Bibles to Judges 22.1. It says in Judges 22.1, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Then verse 22, In order to test Israel by them, whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their fathers did or not. So the Lord allowed these nations to remain, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. This is a fascinating point. During the time of Joshua, 
God helped the Israelites drive out enemy after enemy, but God purposely left some enemies of Israel around to test Israel because God knew Israel would go apostate. All nations in history have failed the prosperity test. Israel failed the prosperity test, and God knew that they would. Therefore, God left a certain number of enemies around Israel to test them, and this testing was battle. And oftentimes, God uses war to wake up a people. So every time the people of Israel would forget the source of their prosperity and stop worshiping the prosperity itself, or start to worship the prosperity, God would send famine or war upon them so that they would wake up. Now, I've noticed dogs, when you have food in their hand, they look at you admiringly, and they want your food, and they stare at you, and you think it's cute. But as soon as you give them that food, their head loses its focus with you and they go straight to the food, straight to the prosperity, straight to the food, which it would be tantamount to the prosperity we have. And it's Judges 21, 22-1 that we just studied. It's Joshua. Oh, well. Anyway, so the dog looks admiring at you for a while, and then when you give it its food, it pays no attention to you. This is how many believers are in the Christian way of life. As soon as God gives you a little prosperity, it's bye-bye. And that's why fickle believers never make it in the Christian way of life. This is not how one should live the spiritual life, only listening to doctrine when you're down and out. This is the life of a lukewarm believer, and God will vomit you out of his mouth. You see, God used the enemies of Israel to wake them up, just as God uses our enemies to wake us up. That's why 9-11, even famous evangelist who should know better asked, why did this happen? God raised up an enemy to test us, to wake us up out of our idolatry worship so that another generation might grasp on to those precious pearls of the word of God and run with them grow in grace and stand in the gap for this country holding back the storm clouds of divine discipline even though there is a need for evangelism in this country what we need most is for believers to wake up and make Bible doctrine number one we need believers who can say just as David did on thy word, I meditate both day and night. Now we're going to shift gears in the study. And we're going to start to study a Bible story. It's in the book of Judges. And it puts into perspective what happens to a client nation that drifts from the word of God and moves in their thinking from the objective reality of the word of God to the subjective thinking of self-absorption, which eventuates in terrible degeneracy. The times of the judges was a very degenerate time for the people of Israel. Judges 17.6 states, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, no one lived by principle. No one had the objective thinking from the word of God. Rather, most everyone was a subjective thinker. A person who did right in his own eyes even when he was in sin. So the Bible story that we're going to study begins in Judges, chapter 19. A young Levite, the Bible doesn't name him, but this man is obviously a kind and tender man. He's very gracious. He is what you ladies would probably call a gentleman. He lived in the hill country of Ephraim, and he married a woman from Bethlehem. This was a, time, a bad time for marriage in Israel, much like it's a bad time for marriage in the United States. It wasn't uncommon in those days, just as it's not uncommon now, for women to get bored with one man or for one man to get bored with one woman. And a woman would especially become bored with a gentleman. What kind of excitement could this gentleman bring to a modern-day woman during the time of the judges in Israel? 
she got bored with this nice fellow. So therefore, she began to flirt. She flirted with every man in sight. And why did she flirt? Why do women flirt? It's very simple. Subjective thinking. She already had a nice husband, obviously, and he gave her a lot of attention. But she became bored with that attention. And why? She wanted more attention. And she flirted, not because she wanted out of a bad relationship. She flirted because this stroked her own ego. She was a subjective thinker. And subjective thinkers inevitably get involved in approbation lust. And what does approbation mean? It means approval. When you get your eyes on people and you lust for the approval of people, you are in subjective thinking. You are full of arrogance and you might not even know it. You see, this woman flirted because she enjoyed receiving approbation from many men, not just one man. Flirting is not necessarily the sin. It is the approbation lust behind the flirt that is a sin. A woman who is mature in her soul does not flirt. A mature woman cares not for the adulation of men. A mature woman understands the depravity of man, and she lives in humility, which means she lives full of integrity. So men should always remember, when they see a flirtatious woman, that she's not flirting with you because she thinks you're great. She's flir flirting with you because she wants you to think she is great. And she wants you to stroke her ego along with every other man in her periphery. Avoid her. Don't be like the idiots on Gone with the Wind who were all around Scarlet O'Hare like dogs in heat. Whoever wrote Gone with the Wind knew why women flirt. She flirted for attention. And flirting is one of the fastest ways for a woman to build up her ego. In effect, Eve flirted with Satan. And look what happened. Unfortunately, flirting often leads to adultery. So the Levite's wife was a flirter, and she committed adultery. Not just once, but many times. The Bible says she played the harlot with many men and left her husband to go live with her father. After four months of being away, her husband became lonely. So he decided to go to his father-in-law's house and get his wife back. And when the adulterous woman saw her husband, she had obviously missed him because she brought him into her father's house. And it's very likely that this woman was the Levite's right woman because not only could he stop thinking about her, but he was obviously still in her soul. And get this, her father was glad to see him. And why not? Her father-in-law had sense enough to know that this guy was a good one, probably the best one around. And he knew that all the other men out there were paramours, simply stroking her ego to have a one-night stand, and then she would move on to the next man. But what was this father to do about his ad adulterous daughter? Nothing. Adultery and fornication had become commonplace in the land. What happened to the Mosaic Law? It's gone. What's happened to marriage in this country? The same thing. Over 50% divorce, and most young people don't even choose to marry. They shack up with partner and then another partner. Are you starting to see the parallel? Let's read Judges 19.4. And the Levite's father-in-law detained him, and he remained with him three days. So they ate, and they drank, and they lodged there. The father-in-law was so excited to see his son-in-law that he looked, notice, detained him. In other words, he wasn't going to let his daughter let this one go. And the father-in-law made his son-in-law feel very comfortable by feeding him well, giving him wine. And it wasn't grape juice, so it was wine. The next part of this gets pretty comical. And I hope you'll be able to see that. I'll read verses 5 through 9. Now it came about on the fourth day that they got up early in the morning, and he, the son-in-law, prepared to go. And the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Sustain yourself with a piece of, piece of bread, and afterward you may go. So both of them sat down and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, 
please be willing to spend the night and let your heart be merry. And then the son-in-law arose to go, but his father-in-law urged him so that he spend the night there again. And on the fifth day he arose to leave early, but the girl's father said, Please, have breakfast and wait until the afternoon. So both of them ate. When the son-in-law arose arose to go along with his wife and servant, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, the day is drawn to a close. Please spend the night. Spend the night and let your heart be merry. Then tomorrow you may arise early for your journey so that it, and go home. The father-in-law was not willing to let his son-in-law out of his sight because he wanted to keep an eye on their marriage. He thought that perhaps his influence might keep his daughter in line, but the Levite had to go. How much eating and drinking can one man take? What does all of this eating and drinking indicate? It indicates prosperity. Israel was prosperous. There's no mention of work. They just sat and ate and drank for six days straight just eating and drinking and making merry. Even though Israel had gone into degeneracy, God in His grace blessed this land of milk and honey, just as He is blessing the United States today. So finally, the son-in-law leaves his father-in-law's house in the evening. And as noted, his wife decides to go with him. After they had been moving along all afternoon, the sun began to set, and everyone, especially the man's servant, became tired. And he said, Please come. Let us turn aside into this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. However, his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who are not the sons of Israel, but we will go on as far as Gibeah. Now why doesn't this man want to stay in a foreign country? Because the Levite knows that those foreign countries in those days were dangerous. Plus, he had enough national pride that he would rather stay amongst his people, the people in Israel. We'll continue. And he said to his servant, Come and let us approach one of these places, and we will spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they passed along and went their way, and the sun set on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there in order to enter the lodge in Gibeah. When they entered, they sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into the house to spend the night. Now why wasn't anyone available to take him in? Think about it. If a stranger walked up to this house today, would you let him spend the night? No, you wouldn't. And why wouldn't you? Because of crime. There was a time in America when you might have done that. There was a time in America when people left their doors unlocked. There was a time when a child could walk miles to school without fear of a kidnapper, only maybe a little fear of the neighborhood dog. There was a time when you could pick up hitchhikers without fear of murder or rape or anything. There was a time when almost everyone had no problem with being a good Samaritan. What has happened? Crime has happened. And we have rampant crime in this country, even though they say it's on the decline. It's not really. It's awful. You don't leave your doors unlocked. You see, enforcement of the law is the enforced humility that a society places upon those who never grow out of subjective thinking. And that's why thousands of believers are sitting in jails in America today because of subjective thinking, arrogance, and inability to orient to authority. Continuing, And behold, an old man was coming out of the field from his work at evening. Now the man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was staying in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going, and where are you coming from? Finally, someone had taken interest in the young fellow. And wouldn't you know, it would be a fine elderly gentleman from the hill country where he was from, the same area the Levite was from. This elderly gentleman had probably moved down to the city to make some extra money. So the Levite answered him and said, We are passing from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, for I am from there, and I went to Bethlehem in Judah, but now I am going to my house, and no man will take me into his house. Yet there is both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and also bread and wine for me, the maidservant, 
and the young man who is with your servants. There is no lack of anything. You can almost hear the begging in the voice of the Levite. He's saying, look, I have plenty. I have enough for me, for you, and everyone. I just need a place to stay. But then the elderly gentleman shows a perfect picture of grace when he says, peace to you, which in Israel they would say shalom, which means peace and prosperity. Only let me take care of all your needs. However, do not spend the night in the open square. What he's saying is dangerous out here. So he took him into his house and gave the donkeys fodder, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. This elderly man understood something. He understood something of what it means to be gracious. The Levite was willing to pay for his stay, feed himself, and feed everyone. But the elderly man was not only going to take care of the Levite and his family, but also his donkeys. So we'll continue. While they were making merry, what does this mean? This means they were enjoying wine, not grape juice. They were drinking wine and having a good time. Then the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, that's the literal translation, surrounded the house, pounding the door. And they spoke to the owner of the house, the old man, and said, Bring out the man who came into your house that we may rape him anally. Your Bibles probably say relations, but it means to rape, to have sex with. And the only way a man can have sex with a man is to rape him anally. So, that it means intercourse. And, the only, and this is disgusting, but this is what they wanted to do. Now we're going to look at a verse on homosexuality and the reasons behind it. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 121. This is the NASB translation. Romans 121. We'll start in Romans 122. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This has to do with the worship of idols in various forms during the time of the Apostle Paul. Today we have fools who practice the humanization of God, ascribing to God sinful human attributes rather than professing the true essence of God. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What does it mean that God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity? This doesn't mean that God was causing them to sin, as that may appear on the surface. Absolutely not. This simply means that God, being a gentleman, allows the negative volition of people to run its course to its logical conclusion. God does not interfere with volition. Therefore, God stepped out of the way and allowed these people in subjective thinking. To, they came to the point where they rejected everything, including their birth of being a man or a woman, and they lusted for the same sex. This subjective thinking is in the stream of consciousness, and that arrogance eventuates, and such a person will exchange the truth of God for a lie and accept a futile, belief system set up by Satan himself. In other words, they become locked into the cosmic system through a function of mataiotes. That's the Greek word for vacuum in the stream of consciousness. For while the stream of consciousness is not receiving truth, something must fill it. So therefore, satanic doctrine enters the soul because of mataiotes, the vacuum of the soul. And then that person exchanges the truth for a lie. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. 
So are people born homosexual? No. It is through consistent subjective thinking, consistent arrogance, and consistent rejection of the authority of God that results in homosexuality. It is only logical that after you reject every form of authority set up by God, you will move deep into subjective thinking, which is, as we noted last night, thinking that is, or last week, thinking that is totally apart from reality. So in subjective thinking, you separate from reality. And even though you are a man, you have separated from reality and you have a reprobate mind separate from the normal function of sex. These verses are specifically talking about the unbeliever. But this can happen to the believer who rejects the word of God, Bible doctrine. These verses are talking about the unbeliever who comes to God consciousness. That's why in verse 21 the Bible says, For even though they knew God, this does not mean that they have believed in Christ. This simply means that they had come to the point of God consciousness. God consciousness is talked about in the previous verses. You can look that up later. Yet even though they had come to God consciousness, they reject the gospel of Christ, or they may even say they don't want to know nothing about anything about God to start with. So they begin to move through the stages of the hardening of the stream of consciousness all the way up to the point where they exchange the normal function of sex between a man and a woman for the unnatural sex of homosexuality. Now we'll continue with the story in the book of Judges. The man, the owner of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my fellows, please do not, not act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Do not commit this folly. Here is my virgin daughter and her concubine and his concubine. Please let me bring them out to you so that you may ravish them, or rape them is what it means, and do to them whatever you wish. But do not commit such an act of perversion against this man. Note bene, take note. Notice that even though this is a time of free love and free sex in Israel, even though this is a time when sexual immorality is prominent and marriage is falling apart, Israel has not gone, gone so far as to accept the act of homosexuality, which is an abnormal sexual lust. A man's lust for a woman or a woman's lust for a man is sinful outside of marriage, but this is normal sexual sin. Men lusting toward men and women lusting toward women is abnormal. And not even in Israel, during this time of degeneracy, can they stomach homosexuality? Notice the man says, Do not commit such an act of perversion against this man. And he even offers up his own virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Isn't this man generous? First of all, he feeds the Levites donkeys, servant, and wife. And they drink and eat and make merry. And then... Some other people visit his house, some perverts who want to have anal sex. So he offers him his virgin daughter and another man's wife. Now why is all of a sudden this nice old man thinking so irrationally? It's fear. He's scared of these brutes. He knows how violent they can be. And a lot of people make fun of homosexuality and quip about it. But in fact, men who are homosexual can, can be extraordinarily violent. And it's happened in this country many times, but it does, it, it's underreported. So continuing in Judges 19.25, But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and brought her out to them. Who is seizing the concubine? The Levite. The Levite is scared because the men would not listen to the old man. So the Levite grabs his wife and throws her out to those people so they can rape her. They raped her and abused her all night until morning. Then they let her go at the approach of dawn. You see here that not only had the irrational, irrationality of fear gripped the old man, but also the husband, the one who had tried so hard and succeeded in getting his wife back, 
now throws her out to these homosexual men in hopes that they wouldn't bother him. This is subjectivity. What man would give away his wife to some rapist because he fears that he might be raped himself? Yes, in the beginning of the story, we learn that her husband is sweet. And, and he went back to get his wife. And that's because he loved her and he wanted to retrieve his wayward wife. And a lot of women would say, isn't that sweet? And yes, the old man had a sweet disposition. But guess what? Neither of them had Bible doctrine. And that's obvious. You can tell that while this man is probably one of the nicest one around, he is involved in subjective thinking. And when trouble strikes, he thinks about himself, not his wife. And he throws her out to the wolves, and he doesn't look it so sweet anymore, does he? That's because sweetness does not cut it. You might think a man is sweet, but that same man could be so filled with himself that his sweetness is only a front, a front that covers his objective, arrogant thinking. What you should want from a man is not sweetness, but integrity. Integrity in men is what protects the ladies. And how does a believer get integrity? From the metabolization and application of Bible doctrine. From the objective thinking of being focused on the Word of God both day and night. You can tell that neither the master of the house nor the husband, while both generous, nice men, have the objective reality of Bible doctrine in their souls. Have you noticed that throughout the dialogue between the husband and the father-in-law, and then the husband and the master at the house, that not even once is there a mention of God? What were they all eager to do? They were all eager to eat, drink, and make merry. In other words, they were focused on the details of life. They were lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Of course, there's nothing wrong with eating or drinking. And there's nothing wrong with having a few glasses of wine and becoming a bit merry. But there is something wrong with these actions when your eating, drinking, and making merry takes precedence over your daily intake of the Word of God. And this was obviously the problem with Israel during this time. They were failing the prosperity test. Everyone obviously seems to have enough to eat, to drink, and make merry. And they make a lot of time for this. But there is not one mention of God all the way from Judges 19.1 to Judges 20.18. And in Judges 20.18, they only mention God because they're about to go to war. They're losing their prosperity. And we'll see why they're about to go to war later. Don't skip ahead. We can note that during the times of degeneracy, who gets hurt the most? Women. Children. When men stop fighting for their hearth and home, it's all over for the ladies. They are left to be treated like cattle. Would it be safe for a woman to walk alone today, at any given night, on any given main street in an American city? No, a man could get away with it, but a woman, they can't. So in the case of the Levite and the master of the house, fear gripped their souls, causing them to think irrationally and in terms of subjectivity. And they were more worried about saving their own hide than protecting the women of the house. Therefore, we need to take some points on fear. Point one. Fear is a sign of subjective thinking and will put you on the fast track to self-absorption. Fear is a sign of objective think subjective thinking and will put you on the fast track to self-absorption. Point two. If a person in fear ignores rebound and ignores the divine operating assets available to him, in this case, mainly it would be the faith rest drill, that person will justify their fear. 
We can see this in Judges 25, where the Levite explains his actions to the people of Israel, stating, The men of Gibeah rose up against me and surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me, but instead they raped my wife and she died. Notice the subjectivity of the Levite. He states that this happened because they were going to kill him. And you see, he says nothing about how he threw his wife out to the rapist. So a person in fear ignores, rebound, and ignores the divine operating assets available to him. And in this case, it would be the faith rest drill. And that person who ignores this will justify their fear. If a person continues in fear without rebound, a subjective thinker will deceive himself and become completely unaware of his sin of fear. Notice how in Judges 20 verse 5 the Levite conveniently leaves out the fact that he gave his wife to these homosexuals. This way the Levite supposes he is covering up his sin because he assumes that as long as he is right with man, he is right with God. But this is not the case. During time, point four, during times of difficulty, objective thinking does not call upon the irrationality of fear, but rather calls upon the objective reality of the Word of God. Point four, during times of difficulty, objective thinking does not call upon the irrationality of fear, but rather calls upon the objective reality of the Word of God. Point five. The simplest application of doctrine can defeat fear through utilization of the faith rest drill. Even an immature believer can claim the promises of God. Point five, the simplest application of doctrine can defeat fear through utilization of the faith rest drill. Even an immature believer can claim the promises of God. Here are some Bible verses that you should claim when you're faced with a situation in which fear might raise its ugly head. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For Jehovah thy God, he is he that will go. He is it that doth go with thee. This is old English. <laughs> he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31.8 and Jehovah, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Isaiah 41.13 For I, Jehovah thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Luke 12.7 But the hair, very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Second Timothy, I didn't write the verse, 7, Second Timothy verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. What is the, the power? The power is the power of God the Holy Spirit, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. The love is the reciprocal love toward God. Now we'll continue with Judges 19.26. As the day began to dawn, the woman came and fell down at the doorway of the man's house where her Lord was until full daylight. Did you notice something? It should have slapped you in the face. For the first time in all of this story, she recognizes her husband as Lord. Before, she played the harlot. She dumped, jumped from man to man, but now she has suffered at the hands of brutes. And even though her husband was the one who gave her to them, the verse indicates what was in her thoughts, what was in the woman's soul as she drug her way to the doorway and was sprawled out literally on the th and with her hands pointed toward the threshold. This is sad. For this is the one time when she recognized her husband as Lord, and it could only happen in her death. Some people refuse to learn the easy way. Some people have hard heads. 
Some people love to think subjectively and will bow their necks at authority any chance they get. So what happens? Sometimes God enforces humility through severe punishment. This woman would have went on in life and played the harlot again. She was fickle, silly, and this occurred because of it. She would never have recognized her husband as Lord if this hadn't happened. God gave her some enforced humility. Look at verse 27. And when her Lord arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, then behold, his wife was sprawled out at the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. This is a sad picture. She crawled in pain. She had been raped all night long. And when they let her go, she crawled back in severe pain to where her Lord was. And there she died, her hands on the threshold as she tried to make her way back to her Lord. This is sad, but what makes it even worse is the fact that her Lord, while all of this was going on, slept peacefully until the sun had fully risen. How could any man do such a thing? He had absolutely no consideration for the wife he went back to get. He slept while she was being raped. You see, he had justified his sin of fear to the point where he could actually sleep comfortably. And of course, he was probably under some influence of wine. But in any case, it wouldn't matter. He had justified himself to where he could sleep comfortably. Besides, it's better her than me, was probably his thinking. So he slept until not dawn, but the sun had already risen. So now you should be able to see how arrogant, subjective thinking in a society can ruin it. This is a perfect picture of a nation that has moved into degeneracy, and it is a parallel to what is happening in this country. We are out of time, so we'll continue tomorrow. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again to live in a free country where we can freely gather to freely hear the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit take the things that we have noted tonight and make them a source of blessing and a challenge to us so that we can stop thinking in terms of subjectivity but start thinking in terms of the objective reality of Bible doctrine. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. the humility of Jesus Christ that has brought all of us salvation. If Christ had not been humble, we would not be saved. This ends the introduction. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity this morning to feed upon your word, to take your word and convert gnosis into epinosis. May God, the Holy Spirit, challenge us by what we have learned Challenge us to have this attitude in ourselves that was also in Christ Jesus, the attitude of humility, the modus operandi of objective thinking. And may we learn to recognize when we are thinking subjectively and from a viewpoint of arrogance. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.